This lecture focuses on the design of horizontal curves in consideration of stopping sight distance requirements and the underlying physics involved with curve navigation. After today's lecture, students should be able to label and define all of the defining characteristics of a simple circular curve and then determine the minimum curve radius based both upon the underlying physics involved as well as in consideration of stopping sight distance. So if we think about fundamental highway alignment, what we're typically trying to do when we talk about geometric design of highways is we're trying to take a three-dimensional problem where we're trying to align the vertical and horizontal alignments of a road facility and break that into two two-dimensional problems, which essentially eases our ability to design each of those respective alignments. And in doing so, it's important to note that the horizontal plane is what's going to control our highway design process. So obviously our road is going to have different lengths in terms of the horizontal and vertical planes and so we assume for sake of uh, convenience that the horizontal is the controlling alignment. And so as I alluded to we're taking a three-dimensional roadway and breaking that into two two-dimensional alignments. So you see a plan view which is essentially an overhead here showing us what the horizontal alignment of a roadway is and then the side view the vertical alignment is shown in the underlying profile view here. And so to connect those alignments, we'll focus on horizontal curves for the purposes of today's lecture. And there are four general types of horizontal curves which we design in transportation engineering, with the most widely designed of those being the simple circular curve. So the wide majority of design applications will focus on simple circular curves, as you see demonstrated right here. Uh, we will also get into, as we get further into geometric design, the concept of reverse curves. So if you have curves that are going in opposite directions, one ends and you're turning right, and then you go into a left curve, for example. A compound curve is where you connect two curves of differing radii. And then lastly, a spiral curve is essentially used as a transition into a circular curve or another type of curve where we're continually changing the radius to provide a smooth transition from the tangent section to the forthcoming curve or between curves of different radii. Now for the purposes of CE355, our focus is going to be exclusively on the simple circular curve, which is the most widely utilized in transportation engineering. So with horizontal curve, a few fundamental characteristics. This is a curve diagram, and so hopefully you are somewhat familiar with these terms if you've seen surveying, for example, at this point. And so when we talk about curves, we define curves by the PC, the PI, and the PT, which are the point of curvature or the start point of that curve, the point of tangency or the end point of that curve, and the point of intersection is where if you project out from those start and end points of the curves where those projections would intersect then. A few other key terms here. Uh, radius, which is generally being measured to the center line of the roadway, is denoted as R. Uh, L is going to be our curve length, which will be the actual length along this arc as compared to vertical curves where we're concerned just with the horizontal projection. Uh, delta is our central angle, which also corresponds with this intersecting angle you see up here. T is our tangent length measured from PC to PI, or since it's a circle, that same dimension, PI to PT. M is our middle ordinate, so if you draw a straight line, we refer to this right here from A to B as the long chord, so it's the distance between this point and that actual point on the curve directly uh, across from the PI. And then E is the external distance, which is measuring from the point of the curve to the actual PI there directly outside. And from these fundamental characteristics, we can look at the underlying geometry and trigonometry to then use these widely applied relationships. So if we know two of these characteristics, we can then calculate the third, as we'll demonstrate in some of the subsequent example problems. And when we talk about curve design, we also frequently, instead of curve radius, we will often use degree of curve instead. And when we talk about degree of curve, what that's measuring is the degree that would subtend a 100 foot arc. So if you break your curve into a series of 100 foot arc lengths, they would each have this same D value for degree of curvature. And so the simple formula here to compute from radius to degree of curvature is given as follows. And so degree of curvature is nice from several standpoints, one of which 
a radius for a straight tangent section tends toward infinity, but it's nicer for degree of curvature because if you've got a tangent section, i.e. there's no curve, the degree of curve simply reduces down to zero then, and it's actually defined in this nomenclature. So just a quick example problem here. So let's say we've got a horizontal curve on a single lane highway, and we have a PC at station 123 plus 70, and we're given the PIs at station 130 plus 90. We're also told that the curve has a radius of 1,738 feet. And so from that, we want to then be able to calculate the station of the PT. And so one careful point to remember here, so if you just look at this underlying diagram, we can clearly measure the actual distance from the PC to the PI, so we can directly calculate T here. Likewise, this tangent length would have the same length as we see right here, but it's important to remember when we talk about stationing, that's simply referencing our distance from the PC. And so the distance from the PC to the PT is not equal to twice the tangent because we're taking the physical distance along the curve here. So that's a common mistake uh, we just want to outline at the onset here. So to determine the stationing of the PT, we'll actually need to determine what the length of this curve is, the information that's available to us. So to start with the PC and the PI, as we noted, the difference between those is simply equal to our tangent length T. And so from what we know about the stations of the PC and the PI, we can directly solve for T, which in this case is going to be equal to 720 feet. Once we know the tangent length, we can then solve for delta using this equation, the tangent distance is equal to the radius times the tangent of delta over 2. And so with everything else known, we can then directly solve for that delta, which in this case is going to be 45 degrees. And so with delta known to us, we can then plug into this equation for curve length. And so we know our radius is 1,738 feet. Our delta central angle is 45 degrees. And so our curve length in this case is 1,365.2 feet. And with the curve length in hand, we can then solve for the station of the PT. And so we find then in this instance that the PT station is going to be 137 plus 35.2. And so that's just fundamental curve layout. Now a natural question is, well, how do we determine what the actual radius of that curve should be? And so when we're trying to design our horizontal alignment, we're essentially trying to determine how sharp we should make a curve or how long we should make a curve that's transitioning between two tangents that are running at different headings. And so when we look at this, the primary factors that are going to affect that curve design when we think about the underlying physics are the side friction that's going to be generated at the wheel interface with the pavement and then also the super elevation rate at which we bank the roadway. So, so this diagram right here is illustrating the underlying physics involved with a vehicle navigating a curve. And so in looking at this diagram, we see that a vehicle as it's circulating the curve is tending to go outward away from the center of that curve due to centripetal acceleration, which is captured right here. And that force is being resisted by two primary metrics, one of which is the super elevation rate, so how steeply this curve is banked. Obviously, the more we bank that, the greater this angle alpha, the faster that vehicle can go while still maintaining its position on the curve. And then the second factor is the amount of friction being generated here between the tire and the underlying road surface then, which is denoted by this term you see right here. And so through some algebra, we can reduce this down to the equation you see illustrated right here. Now, two important points to note here. First of all, this term right here, f sub s times the tangent of alpha, is going to be very small, so we can essentially assume that's equal to zero, and that term will then drop out of this equation. And then secondly, our super elevation rate, which is telling us how much our road is rising in the vertical direction for every one foot change in the horizontal direction, is going to be equal to 100 times the tangent of this alpha angle. And so consequently, what we can do then is we can take this equation and simply it down to this equation right here for minimum curve radius. So our minimum curve radius is simply equal to our velocity squared times the gravitational constant, which is then multiplied by our super elevation rate in decimal format and our side friction factor. And so what we see right here, this is just reiterating those same factors we just introduced previously. 
Now, in applying this equation, our radius is generally going to be measured in feet. And for our units to cancel out here, uh, super elevation is going to be unitless. So it's just going to tell us how many feet we move in the vertical for every foot in the horizontal direction. And F sub S is also a unitless coefficient of side friction. And our gravitational constant is, of course, going to be 32.2 feet per second squared. And so for our units to cancel out, we actually need our speeds to be in feet per second. Now, obviously, we're frequently working with speeds in miles per hour. So all we would need to do in that instance is to convert this to feet per second, which is just taking 5280 over 3600 or 1.47 roughly, that quantity squared, dividing that by 32.2. And this actually simplifies down to a nicer equation, which is simply our velocity squared over 15 times e plus f sub s. And so in applying this equation, then, our process is generally to determine a super elevation rate, so how steep we can bank a curve. There'll be a natural cap in terms of how large that value can be. I will need to determine a design speed, which will be a function of what class that road facility is. And then based on the speed, that will establish the maximum amount of side friction we're going to be able to generate. And with those given, we can then determine the minimum curve radius. And so the challenge here is then balancing E and F sub S, and the Astro Green Book provides some guidelines for these values. So when we talk about side friction, so this is measuring how much friction is being generated between the wheel and the road surface. And so that's going to be a function of several factors, including weather conditions, tire conditions, driver comfort. But the primary factor we're concerned with is speed. So as speed increases, what happens is your tire is in contact with the road surface for a shorter period of time at higher speeds and so consequently will generate less friction in those circumstances. And so making conservative assumptions in terms of having poor tire condition and wet road surfaces, we'll see design values of 0.5 at 20 miles per hour and 0.35 at 60 miles per hour as per AASHTO. So this is assuming new tires and wet pavement conditions. And F sub S is then going to decrease as our speed increases due to that lesser contact between the tire and the pavement surface, actually. And so in determining design values, we'll generally work with values that are slightly lower than what we see as per Ashto here. And super elevation, conversely, is going to be governed by four primary factors. So we're going to limit how steep we can slope our curves or super elevate them. One of the reasons there is climatic conditions. So if you're under heavy ice and snow, what tends to happen is under wintry conditions, vehicles aren't going as fast. So if you bank your curves too steeply, vehicles will actually start to slide towards the inside of that curve. Uh, related concern, terrain is going to play a role in maximum super elevation. So if you're in more mountainous terrain, you may have constraints in terms of not being able to necessarily fit the curves within our given geospatial constraints. And so in those instances, we might allow for higher super elevation rate than in flat terrain like we'd see in Iowa, for example, where we're free to design much more gradual curves. And as such, we don't have to bank them as steeply. Uh, we see similar constraints in urban settings. You might not have as much flexibility in terms of designing those curves. So we'll allow for steeper super elevations in some instances there. And then also the frequency of slower moving vehicles. So what tends to happen is trucks are problematic here because they are tending to travel at lower speeds on curves. And they also have a higher center of gravity, which makes them more prone to tipping, which introduces additional restrictions in for super elevation. And so when we think about design value, the highest value you'll see in practice is generally 12%, uh, with the most common being either 8 to 10%. And we generally recommend a consistent super elevation rate across a project or a specific highway, because what happens is drivers tend to become accustomed to how steep these curves are up on entry and exit. And so if we think about super elevation, what we're doing is we're going from a normal cross section. So we have a crowned road facility here. So it's slanted away from the center of the road on either side. And what we're doing, we're gradually removing that crown. And then we're starting to transition smoothly until we reach our full super elevation rate on that curve. And we continue at that full super elevation rate. And as we continue towards the other side of the curve, we're going to ramp this down and gradually transition back to that tangent section. And so 
we refer to this transition in two sections. So first of all, we have the tangent runout section. So we're going from a normal cross slope. So let's assume these are each sloped at 2% from the center of that travel way. And over the tangent runout, what we're doing is we're getting rid of this adverse slope on the inside of the curve here. And so we go from the normal cross section to what we see right here, rotating that inner lane around the center line. And then once we get to that point, we're then going to accomplish the super elevation run off, which basically means we're going to take this and we're going to rotate it up so it's at a consistent cross section. And then once we've got that consistent cross section, so let's say this is a consistent than 2% crown, we can then continue to rotate that upward until we reach our maximum super elevation. And so this slide is essentially showing us how this process is done gradually. So we're starting from a normal crown, we're eliminating the adverse crown on the inside, and then we're at full, say 1.5 or 2%. And we keep ramping that up until we get to our full super elevation. And so we won't get into great detail in this class in terms of determining how much length is required to accomplish these transitions. But there are standard design tables provided in the green book and in our course textbook that illustrate common design values for the distances over which these transitions occur. Pulling it all together, our design equation we had indicated previously for minimum curve radius. We also have consistent tables that are provided in ASHTO that allow us to then determine what a minimum curve radius is for specific values of E and F sub S. And so our side friction factor, as you'll notice here, let's just pick a certain speed. So 60 miles per hour, we'll see a consistent value of 0.12, which is significantly lower than what we had seen with good tires. We're assuming much poorer tire condition here. And so that's essentially fixed based on our speed. And so what we do then is we determine what our maximum super elevation is. And from that, if we know our design speed, we know what the highest acceptable super elevation rate is, we can then solve directly for our curve radius. And so a quick example here, let's assume we're designing a roadway for a speed of 70 miles per hour. At one curve along this facility, we have a maximum super elevation rate of 8% and a coefficient of side friction of 0.1. And with this in hand, we want to be able to determine what the minimum radius of curve will be to provide for safe vehicle operation. Now there's one caveat here and that's that this curve radius is being measured to the travel path which means we're measuring to the center of the innermost lane and so consequently take that into consideration when we're setting up these equations and so if we're simply using the minimum radius formula plugging in 70 miles per hour we've got our conversion factor here to go from miles per hour to feet per second and we get a curve radius of 1840 14.8 feet with the designated values of E and FS. And you'll notice that corresponds exactly to what our calculated value is. And what you'll notice here, we're generally rounding that value off to a nice 5 to 10 foot increment ultimately. Now, so that satisfies the actual underlying physics. A second concern from a design standpoint is stopping sight distance. So let's say we're traveling along this curve. There may be objects which are restricting our view as we travel along that curve. This could be a tree line. It could be a sign or other roadside obstacle. And so we want to make sure that drivers have a sufficient sight line in order to stop prior to striking an object up ahead of them in the roadway. And so what we do then, we're defining a few new characteristics here. So instead of looking at our total curve length L, we're concerned with our stopping sight distance s in this case as you see denoted right here so that's the actual distance along the curve here our central angle here is going to be 2 theta and so this is different from the delta angle because this may or may not correspond to the actual curve characteristics and HSO this is our horizontal sight line offset you'll also see this denoted as lowercase m and this is telling us how much distance we would need to clear from that sight obstruction to the center of the innermost lane where we have our greatest constraint for stopping sight distance and so if we assume the curve length is at least equal to stopping sight distance we can just rearrange the curve length equation that we had saw previously and we can solve directly then for s or for delta as a function of s. 
And so simply substituting theta into this design equation, we can then also solve for the middle ordinate that's required. So this tells us what the minimum distance is that must be cleared from the middle of the inside lane to wherever that site obstruction lies. Continuing here and plugging in for theta, we have this equation for middle ordinate, the radius times 1 minus the cosine. 28.65 is just converting 180 divided by 2 pi, divided by our curve radius in feet, and our stopping site distance is showing up in feet here as well. And so solving for s from this equation, we can then arrive at this equation for stopping site distance based on curve radius and that ordinate value. And so a simple example here, let's say we're designing a horizontal curve along a two-lane roadway. Uh, we're given the roadway has 12-foot lanes, and due to expensive excavation, the maximum distance that can be cleared from the center line of that roadway toward the inside lane is 34 feet. So given that we've got local guidelines dictating a maximum super elevation rate of 8%, we want to know what the highest possible design speed is for this curve. And so a few points at the onset. So we're given we have 12 foot lanes and we're told we can clear 34 feet from the center line of the roadway. And so what that means is 34 feet to the center line, but we're only concerned going to the middle of the innermost lane. And so we subtract off a half of that lane width, and so we can clear up to 28 feet from the center of the innermost lane to the inside of the curve where that site obstruction is occurring. And so what we're going to do is simply use an iterative process to determine the maximum speed that will satisfy that site distance requirement. So looking at this equation right here, we know what our cap is, so m can be no greater than 28 feet. We can then select different design speeds as our speeds change, our radii change, our stopping site distances change. And so we're going to solve this inequality so that the right-hand side is no greater than 28 feet. And so let's just say we start with 40 miles per hour. 40 miles per hour results in a stopping site distance of 305 feet. We can then go to our table to determine a value for minimum curve radius, assuming 8% super elevation, and that gives us a radius of 444 feet. So we plug S and R into our equation, and we find that M is equal to 25.9 feet, which is less than the 28 feet that we have allowable, and so we are then safe at 40 miles per hour. So we increase the speed to 45 miles per hour, our stopping site distance and curve radius change and now our middle ordinate we need to provide 27.4 feet in this case which is still less than the 28 foot cap and so we are still safe at 45 miles per hour now we increase that to 50 miles per hour stopping site distance and radius again increasing and now we find that we need to have at least 29.6 feet clear from the center of the inside lane which is above the 28 feet so what that means is we're not able to safely satisfy stopping site distance requirements at 50 miles per hour and so consequently the maximum safe design Design speed for this curve is 45. What we've done briefly here is just shown you an introduction in terms of how the underlying physics are satisfied when we design a horizontal curve, as well as how we satisfy the stopping site distance requirement. And so for a curve to be safely designed, we need to make sure that both of these constraints are ultimately satisfied.